Hi, welcome to another episode of The Golden Years, Understanding Better Living. I am Phyllis Amen, your host. Today we are pleased to have Colin Healy, principal of Colin Healy Designs. For over 25 years, he has used his design skill to help families discover the hidden potentials in their existing homes transforming a cramped floor plan into flowing spaces, finding extra space for growing families, and redesigning homes to support evolving passions. Colin is also a certified aging in place specialist, devoted to helping people stay in their homes safely and comfortably for as long as they choose by designing beautiful, accessible spaces He's a leading advocate for universal design, a practice that strives to make products that are easy to use and to make the built environment easy to navigate for people of all abilities, from the youngest to the oldest. Well, hi, Colin. Thanks so much for being here today. I'm thrilled to be able to share this information with our viewers. Thank you, Phyllis. It's nice to be here. So how did you get into this? Can you tell us a little bit about um, how you arrived in this place? Sure. So I've done architectural design for many years and um, started out doing solar design back in the 1980s. And uh, as my practice developed, I got into a lot of different things. But as my parents got older, I started realizing that they were having challenges. And so my first uh, sort of taste of this whole idea of uh, dealing with accessibility was when my father was ill, he's having trouble navigating a shower. And so I put up a couple of grab bars. I went down to the great big orange orange <laughs> store, you know, and <laughs> right. found some grab bars and, and I put them in and uh, it solved the problem functionally, but I looked at it and said, you know, this doesn't look very good. Right. Because I'm a designer, you know, I wasn't really very satisfied with, with what I saw. But, you know, it solved the problem, and I didn't think much more about it then. And um, then later, when my mother got ill, um, I had to sort of revisit that. And fortunately, she had a little ranch, uh, not a ranch house, but a cape that had the bathroom on the first floor. And um, it had a, um, the, the kitchen was accessible and so forth. So she really didn't have much of a problem because we had already dealt with my dad. But with her, I was also navigating the whole uh, issue of uh, dealing with the health care system and keeping her home as long as we could. We managed to get her to stay in her home until she was 91. Wow, that's fantastic. I know a lot of people strive for that nowadays. I yeah. mean, it's, it's important for people to stay in a comfortable caring environment where they're used to being, you know? That, that's for sure. And, and one of the things that my dad said to, to us as he was in his last days was, your mom wants to stay at home, keep her there as long as you can. So my sister and I were actually on kind of a mission to do that. And um, I'm, I'm sure others have had the same situation where we realized that Although we had planned well for mom to stay at home as long as she could, it's not always the physical aspects that right. that lead you to make a decision to change that. It can be the mental aspects. And my sister would come for uh, two or three days at a time uh, to be with my mom. So she started seeing some things that in my little, you know, one hour or two hour visits right. where I take her to the doctor or something, I wouldn't see. So Cindy, on day two of one of her visits, goes to the store and comes back, and Mom says, oh, I wasn't expecting you. It's so lovely to see you. Right, right, right. And so we yes. kind of knew that our days were numbered keeping her by right. herself, and that led to much more in-home caregiving and the search to figure out what the next step would be, which happened you know, six months or so later. You know, I, I just want to um, say, I was speaking with somebody the other day, and they mentioned that, um, that their uh, sister had actually made a promise to their father that they would keep their mother at home, 
and the sister was really wrestling with that as the yeah. mother advanced in in her you know cognitive decline and physical you know limitations and it turns out that this promise was made like 20 years earlier when the father had passed away so yeah, yeah people really wrestle with that it's not an easy decision and it, it was hard because he was right my mom really did want to stay by herself um, and I sort of came to the conclusion as as I was watching what was happening I said Mom is totally isolated. Even when people do come, five minutes after they're gone, she doesn't remember that they're there, that right. they have come. So it was making it difficult to even track whether she was being cared for it or right. not. And right. we had some episodes where she went for a day or two with no care out of misunderstandings. And the, the other thing was that she um, really wanted to stay but it was becoming dangerous for her. Right. And my sister had to have this really long conversation with her where tears were necessary to convince my mother that we were trying our best to show her our love and the way we needed to do that was to make her safe. Well, you know, I think you bring up a very interesting point about that because when I speak to people or give seminars on caregiving, I say that it's, and I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only person, there are organizations that say this as well, you know, it's important to involve the person in that decision making yeah. process, in that conversation, and let them know that it, you really are concerned for their care, because there's so much emotion that goes into those yeah. decisions, you know. So, um, so besides the grab bars, because I have my own ideas, and we've yeah. had conversations about this, so what other, are the major, would you say, adjustments that people have to make that they probably haven't thought about? Um. Well, I think the, the most um, common sorts of things that people do are the ones that are really necessary for accessibility. So um, there are different levels of accessibility. The most extreme is you're confined to a wheelchair, uh, and actually the most extreme is when you're in a bed, but then the accessibility uh, right. stuff doesn't matter <laughs> right, anymore. Right, I suppose right. that. But um, so the way I think about this in terms of tr trying to make recommend recommendations to people is I start with the experience of what happens when you approach the house. I start right at the curb. Right. You get to the house, how do you get into the house? And Years ago when I, uh, I was really focused on doing solar design, I always knew where south was, you know, because that's the part of the sky where the sun's going to be right. and you're going to get your best solar exposure. And now I find, find myself with this sort of third or sixth sense, if you will, about how I would get somebody in a house, no matter whose house I'm going right, to. Right, right, right. kind of figuring out. <laughs> it's like an occupational hazard. That's you right. Know? <laughs> what would I do here to get somebody into and out of the house? So th that's one thing. Um, and so as an example of just that one thing, one approach is the one that you see all the time, which is put in a ramp. Right. All right. That's the most traditional, probably right. what people think about the most. So my first thing is, is there a place other than the front door where we could put a ramp? Uh, maybe it's in the garage. You just... You roll into the garage, you get people up one step, it's a minor little thing, you get them into the house that way. So th the things that are least obvious from the outside of the house or even in the house, the things that are least obvious as accessibility modifications, I think are the most successful because if you don't notice they're there, it's a big success. Right, right. You know? and. So a, as kind of a principle that I use when I try to explain people when to do these things, um, it's important to do it when you, it's not an emergency. Right. And when you have time to actually think about it. Otherwise, I never would have gone and put in a, res, a, a set of grab bars that looked like they'd be at home in the Howard Johnson's or, you know, <laughs> right. or the restroom on the throughway, right, you know? Right, right, right. It, it was the same kind of right. grab bar. But I think that people, a lot of uh, decisions that people make are based on the fact that they're in an emergency situation. Exactly. And, and you know, I don't know, let's see, myself, I'm in my mid-60s. I don't know if I would start thinking, oh, maybe I should put grab bars in my shower or maybe I should, 
you know, make certain other modifications. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you some of them that I'm thinking about, okay. to tell you the truth. Yeah. Um, because toilet seats sometimes are low, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and I'm pretty physically agile, but I have thought about this, um, especially like the other day I hurt my back and, and I was like, oh, you know, this is kind of low. I'm having trouble with this. Yeah. And some people don't like the concept of raised toilet seats, so that's one thing I thought about. Um, another thing is I thought about, especially because of my back, but I've thought about it in other circumstances for people, let's say, or Alzheimer's or dementia. You know, if you have a, a microwave and you're expecting people to heat up things for themselves, but the microwave is above the stove. Exactly. You know, um, yeah. and, and I thought of it even more so the other day when I knew we were having this interview because I was reaching for the microwave. I was like, wait a minute, I can't even, I can't even move. So what about other kinds of modifications that people haven't thought about. Okay, so what you're getting into now is what um, would be called activities of daily living, the right. things that you have to do just to kind of get through life. So to address the toilet, um, what I was going to say about the grab bars is in the 10 years or so since my dad, you know, needed this help initially and I went and chose these uh, not very stylish uh, pieces right. of equipment. <laughs> right. um, all of the manufacturers of plumbing supplies, kitchen supplies, and so forth are all recognizing that the baby boom market, which you and I are both part of, right. um, is big and they're making nice products to accommodate that. Oh, that's that. cool. So instead of having to put in the, the grab bar with the knurled uh, sort of texture on it right. and it goes back to the wall with these great big plates now they look like they match your towel bars oh that's very cool but i have a question about yeah. that so because people as they get older you know their sight changes um they may have figure ground um, issues mm -hmm. so if it looks like your towel bar would they know to grab it it's the same thing with the toilet actually yeah. if the toilet is white and your floor is a light color um, that's another issue it's a figure yeah, those, ground issue those those are good points but I, I think my experience has been people will grab whatever's there if they think they're gonna fall oh, that's and, a good point. and um, if you, you have them placed properly, you know, you need grab bars to be able to get onto and off of the toilet. Right. You need them in the shower, and that's pretty much it. Um, at our house, my wife has a problem with her knee, so it's difficult for her to um, get upstairs sometimes. And at each of the doorways, I've got little bars for her to sort of grab onto to help her get through the door. Oh, that's and, cool. And now, they don't look as odd because they're kind of pretty, you know? Oh. So um, that's good. Back to the toilet for a moment. Now there's something called a comfort height toilet, which gets you up a little bit higher than a standard toilet. Oh, that's so great. No matter what home I'm doing these days, I specify a comfort height toilet. Now you might say to me, oh, it's a young couple and they've only got kids, and so why do they need that? Right. Well, they've got a grandmother probably or a grandpa right, that's right, going right. to come and visit. Why shouldn't they be accommodated? Right, or or any you know friend yeah. or whoever you know they may exactly. have a party, whatever, and um, and then people wouldn't really say anything about the fact that the toilet is low because they don't that's want right. to even acknowledge that. I mean, if we weren't having this conversation, yeah. I really wouldn't be telling that to anybody. And and I don't think I'm dishonoring my mother's memory by telling you that there were situations where I had to go into the bathroom and help her get off the toilet in various situations. No, I think that's real. And, and, and I that's, appreciate that's, you sharing that, yeah, actually, because I'm sure there are many people yeah. that are in that situation. Yeah. What about lighting? Well, lighting is an important thing. And these days, uh, well, one of the things we talked about the other day is as we get older, um, we need more light to see. So somebody my age, late 60s, early 70s, um, according to people who know these things, I need four times as much light as a young person right. to be able to read something. And I find myself always getting my phone out to 
brighten yeah, something yeah, up or holding <laughs> things up to a window. <laughs> and Isn't that the first sign with when your, your sight is starting yeah. to become compromised? You say there's not enough light in here and you take it over to the light and everybody else says, no, it's, it's perfectly fine. Yeah. Right, well, right? it's not for us. Yeah, it's not for us, yeah. right? And, and I can't imagine uh, what it'll be like later. I remember sitting with my mom in a movie theater. Uh, I took her to the movies one night and uh, we're, we're watching the the stuff that's going on on the screen. She'd said, oh, you'd think they'd play some music or something. And the music is going on <laughs> and she couldn't hear it at all. Right, right, right. Right. So uh, there are all sorts of experiences that they're having that we have no idea about. Right. And, and you know, um, if we get to that point, hopefully we'll... Yeah experience that. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but whatever. Well, but maybe it's a good thing because we're talking about it and we're aware of it. Yeah, and, and I think this is something that's happened, sor happening sort of generationally is that there are so many of us that are sort of entering this time that our generation has gone through uh, taking care of our parents. And my mom died at 93. My dad died at about 85. And I have this sort of wealth of experience about that that a lot right. of us have now. And we're saying, oh, my God, I don't want it to be like this for me. You know, it's interesting you say that because um, when I do seminars or actually even in my book, I, I talk about, you know, my first caregiving experience I never expected as a 15-year-old young girl oh my to goodness. be caring for my grandmother. And it, you know, was a variety of circumstances that led me to that. But, um, yeah, we just don't know when we're going to be in that situation. But that kind of led me to this space. Yes. And you draw on that experience. And, you know, you want it to be different for you or for other people that you know um, that are of that age or yeah. older. Well, uh, thinking back, um, I told you that early on I did solar design. And we, we use this principle called passive solar design, which is using the building as a way to collect solar energy. Mm -hmm. And one manifestation of that was the idea of a solar greenhouse or right. a sunspace. So our company was called Sunspace. Oh, cool. And so we would build these south-facing, uh, essentially glass rooms on the side of a house. And at one point, my dad, who was working for me, uh, decided he would build a greenhouse on the end of his house and it happened that my grandfather was going through a really really serious illness and he was living with them in the bedroom that was attached to where this greenhouse would be and my grandfather was a, a lifelong gardener and I swear when that greenhouse went on it added two years to his life oh absolutely because he was able to you know, sit in the sun and pet the cat and tend to his plants. We had four little growing beds, and he had stuff growing year-round then. You know, there's a study um, that I had read about, and like I said, I, I, you know, I have several of these things in my book, and I talked about it, and um, where they did a study years ago, many, many years ago, and there were people in nursing homes, I believe, and um, they gave one a group of people plants, and they told that they they told them they were responsible for watering the plant and tending to the plant and watching over the plant. Yeah. And the other people had a plant, but they didn't have to do anything with the plant. Somebody would come in and water it and tend to it. And the people who had the plant in their room that had responsibility for the plant thrived. They were more interactive, they spoke to people, they, you know, seem to you know emotionally do yes. better so I mean it that's exactly what you're yeah. talking about and it's really probably not just about plants but anything that you have that you can relate to that you can tend to that was a passion of yours will obviously help so I have another question okay. because you, when you started out you said um, if people were bed bound so I'm not talking about people who are bed bound because then they're not getting out of bed yes. but what adjustments do you have to make for people and I'm sure there are who people, you know, who are older, who may get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, yeah. or what flooring kinds of adjustments have to be made, okay. not only in a bedroom, but even the rest of the house. Okay. So uh, let's talk about flooring for a minute. Um, one of the things that w we do when we're, we're working with people that are visually impaired, and that's practically anybody over right, 70. Right, right, right. I've been wearing these for quite right, a few I, years. I wear them for yeah. reading. But is that 
we try to get rid of the throw rugs, right? Any anything that's loose, um, and try to make uh, reduce the amount of places where you could trip on something. So right. loose rugs go immediately. Um, what about those saddles on on in doorways? Saddles actually uh, can be a problem, but ADA the uh, Americans with Disability Act has a whole series of specifications about what's acceptable for you know the amount of slope and how much can be vertical and so forth so as long as you follow those regulations you're probably fine but what I would recommend is if you have a situation where there's going to be some plane change meaning a, a change in the height is there be a change in color as well so you can see great it coming. Great idea, great idea. So you were talking about figure ground. That's right. one of those aspects. The idea um, of you know the toilet being a different color than the floor is also another important one. And look for places where there's contrast uh, so that you can see where the wall comes and meets the floor, where there's a corner, all those things so that they're easy to identify. So some of this is right. just done with paint right? or picking the right tile. Co correct. You, yeah. know, uh, you know, when you say that, because I think of people with Alzheimer's or dementia, and, you know, uh, they traditionally, or I shouldn't say traditionally, but, you know, there comes a point when they're having figure ground issues, and, and um, as spaces are designed, you know, to have the walls different colors, people may not want to do that in their home. Yeah. Um, but if you're going to try and accommodate somebody with that kind of, you know, cognitive difficulty, then that's something that really has to be considered because, you know, that's a, an easier way to help people navigate the space, wouldn't you say? Yes, I would say that. So uh, concentrating on those things makes an awful lot of sense. The, um, there, there are just other sort of major things that I tried to do. So we, we talked about going into the house with a ramp. There's another way to do that, which is called the zero entry, which involves raising the grade around the house and planning the landscaping ah. in such a way that you're able to come up to the house and just roll right in. Oh, that's cool. And it's, it's a bigger deal, but an important part of the work that I do is I'm usually working with people on rather larger pro projects than simply putting in hand Right. Uh, handrails and so forth. So we're looking at how do you make these modifications and at the same time increase the value of the house rather than lower the value right. of the house by, you know, imprudent things that you do at, at the last minute. Right, because somebody, if you were putting the house up for resale and somebody came in and saw these ugly looking, you know, or obtrusive grab yeah. bars or whatever exactly. it is that might so be. So you want to make the, it right. so that it's nice. So right. an idea of raising the, the, the grade and raising the surface of the porch so that you can literally roll right into the front door of the house is a lovely thing to do when it's possible. Yeah, and these are things people wouldn't think of yeah, because, exactly. you know, I wouldn't think of them and that's why, you know, yeah. somebody like you who specializes in this with that kind of eye would come and say this is what you can do. That's right. And I guess also, um, you know, there are instances, you know, going back to when, you know, I was a um, teenager and my mother wanted my grandmother to come live with us and uh, my father didn't think that was a good idea. I was a teenager and we'd all have to be on call, you know, 24 hours a day and she wound up going to a nursing home near the house. But um, one of the reasons was that there would be a hospital bed that had to be in the living room. Mm. Now, um, and he thought that would be, uh, you know, it would just be a lot and uh, the living room wasn't that big. So are there situations where people, let's say, want to build an extension where they put a bedroom on the main floor or exactly. on that, and that floor where you, you come in that's accessible? Yeah. So um, I do the bulk of the work that I do of, around aging in place is actually creating first floor living situations. Sometimes it's just a matter of widening doorways so that, you know, if you were to need a wheelchair, you could get into what a room that is already there, right. like a den or right. something like that, that can become the first floor living space. Other times, in order to accommodate enough space to turn a wheelchair, 
Or even it, a walker, actually. Or even a walker, you might right. need to make the bathroom bigger. Right. You might need to add a room if there's not already some room right. that could serve as a bedroom. So creating um, a first floor master suite or in the situation where there's already a family living in the house and you're bringing an older relative or couple to the house, you create what they call an accessory dwelling unit okay. uh, or an ADU, which um, in, in the definition of that, it's a space that is a separate space, but it's completely self-sufficient. So it would have a kitchen, would have a bathroom, right. and so forth. Because I was going to ask you about that. I mean, obviously, if you had, let's say, a half bath on that floor, you'd have to, you know, modify that to make it a full bath. A full bath. Right. That's right. And sometimes you can find space for that if you have the great good fortune that there's a closet next to it right. that you can make it bigger. That's a wonderful thing. One of the tricks that I use to make um, a smaller bathroom at least approach full sec accessibility is to put in what they call a curbless shower. Oh, that's interesting. And Tell so, us about that. What's that? So a curbless shower is a sim essentially turning the whole bathroom into the shower. So you, you turn it into a wet room. Ah. And this is very, it's becoming more popular now. I think they had those in Europe because I lived in Europe from uh, about six months many years ago. Yeah. And I think I remember that. I, I almost said that because it right. is very common in Europe, right. but now in the U.S. we're doing this more. And one of the things that, that most people don't actually re realize is that the best way to transfer from a wheelchair to a toilet is to be able to back up to the wall next to the toilet and transfer right. sideways. And I think I told you a story about reading through an entire book of uh, plans that are supposed to be accessible and right. not one of them yeah, had a situation <laughs> right. like that. There right. wasn't an accessible bathroom right. in the whole book right. that was supposed to be about accessibility. Yeah, why is that? So you People think they just don't understand. Right. They, they don't take the time to plan for it. So the, ide the idea that I use um, when I have a small bathroom that I need to make accessible is you actually have the toilet next to the shower so you can back up into the shower ah. and transfer onto the toilet. And you can get a pretty small bathroom and get to the point where you can actually use it for a wheelchair if the, everything works out right. So this, if the entire room is a shower, yeah, because I'm trying to think back, well, it was many years ago, yeah. I'm trying to think back, so, so then the, the, the shower head is the the water goes all over? Well, or what, no. Can you explain that? Yeah, yeah. So one way to think about this is if the entire room is a shower, there can still be, uh, you know, movable doors that allow this to oh. happen, or there could be a shower curtain that can be pulled. Oh, okay. And another uh, thing that's very common when you're dealing with older people is they want to shower sitting down, and right. so you use a handheld shower for that, and so you have the seat placed in such a way that they can reach up and grab the handheld shower and use it handheld, or it can be on a bar that goes up and down, so you can place oh. it where it needs to be to direct it where it's not going to spray all yeah, over the place. Yeah, because isn't there a statistic that most accidents happen in the home and most happen in the bathroom? Yeah. Wasn't there? Um, exactly. Mo yeah. yeah. I couldn't cite the number, but, right. I, I remember but the principle that is correct. Yes. Yeah. Did yeah. we discuss lighting? Actually, we didn't talk no. about lighting. So one of the beautiful things about lighting today is that we have all these LED lighting uh, solutions. Right that can bring a tremendous amount of light with very small fixtures. So you don't have to have the great big six inch, uh, what they call cans in the right, ceiling right, anymore. Right, right. They can be smaller and they can even be only this deep. So what looks like a recessed light on the ceiling might be shaped more like a pancake. Oh, and it, cool. it allows them to be placed uh, more flexibly and they can be tr controlled electronically. So there are, um, systems now that are becoming very affordable where you can create uh, a control system in the house that you can control from your phone or a tablet where wow, you can decide terrific. that when I wake up in the morning I do that and all the lights that I need that light my way to 
the kitchen will come on and so forth. So are those, are those ceiling lights or can any of them be in the floor? They can be really wherever you want oh, them that's, to be. Oh, that's terrific. Because it's a matter of whether they're available with the right control system. That's and I, I don't profess to be an expert on that, but that is um, the sort of thing that I'm starting to advise my clients. So I'm, I'm in a networking group, and we now have a fellow that is, um, his, his company is Stratatech, and they right. specialize in this sort of thing. Oh, that's good to know. So what about, you know, when I was saying about the kitchen and the microwave, what yeah. other kinds of uh, kitchen modifications would people need to make? So uh, one of the things that my friend Eric talks about in this little download that I have here is that the appliances that are good for, for people aren't really good unless you put, put them in the right place. Right. So one of the places I often put a microwave now is in an island or below uh. the countertop so that you can reach it from, uh, if you're a kid right. coming home having to deal with mom not being home yet right. and you want to warm something up, that's great, but it's also great for a person in a wheelchair. Right. And or even uh, for somebody in a walker who may have, that's right. you know, they're, they're, they may have back issues or, yeah. or their, um, their posture is now compromised. That's right. Or, you know, if they're in a walker and their balance isn't so great, so now you have to hold on to the walker and pull the door of the microwave yep. and set it. And then how do you take it out if it's above you and it's, the plate is hot? And so there yeah, are those Yeah, so there are all those things to think through. And, and um, it often involves lowering the cook surface and lowering a work surface that's adjacent to it to make it possible for somebody to, you know, live independently while right. in a wheelchair. And so that's becoming more accepted today. Um, I do the same things in bathrooms where um, I, I recommend that people have a situation where either they plan now for one of the sinks two sinks in a bathroom off and a master bath, right. for one to be lower or to at least plan that um, one vanity will have the plumbing set so that it could be mounted lower at a oh. future date. So I have one of those in a house in Danbury right now that we, we took that tack. They decided, no, nah, I don't like that lower thing, but they know that it only costs, you know, four or five hundred dollars right. for a vanity, they could put it in later. Oh, if that's, they that's to. great if they, ha you know, that people are starting to think about yeah. that so down the ro for down the road. Exactly. So addressing that for a moment, some people still think that, you know, I don't want to have grab bars. I'm, you know, I'm only 50 or right. 60. I don't want to have that. Right. But if they're modifying, if they're doing a new bathroom, it makes sense to plan for putting in the blocking in the wall that's necessary for that. Very often, um, I'll plan for an extra outlet at the top of a stair so that mm. sometime in the future, if they decide they want to put a, a, a chair a lift, chair lift oh, in, that makes sense. the power's already there. That so it's those little sense. things that might cost a few hundred dollars now that would cost you a ton of money and a lot of aggravation to do later on that will do when any renovation is going so, on. So, so um, would it not be in people's best interest to contact um, to contact you? Let's say they're getting to that point, 50, 60, yeah. to think about this, just like you think about other things. Like I tell people, exactly. um, you know, you can't get car insurance when you're in a car accident. We get, you know, yeah. we get life insurance, we get medical insurance. So, you know, to think, start, just to start to think about it. Not that you're saying, oh my God, I'm going to need this, but just, yeah. you know, just to become aware of what, what you might need and to start to think about it now. I certainly do encourage that. And what I encourage people to do is make a master plan of all the things that they think they're going to need. So I do a home evaluation where we, we really talk through their lifestyle. We try to figure out whether how long they want to stay in their home um, and what is necessary to make that happen. And then we'll do a total, at least a description of what the things are going to be that they'll do. Sometimes, like a family that I'm working with in Lewisboro now, they're in their late 60s and they're thinking, they love this home, they love their neighborhood, they want to stay there forever, what do we need to do? So I've drawn the entire house so that we can 
plan where the lighting is going to change. Um, we even have thought through when they do their kitchen and when they do their bathroom upstairs, we're going to take a, a room that's downstairs on the lower level, which is a walkout, and really set that up so that they'll have a place to live awesome. while all these oh, that's changes terrific. are happening on the second floor of the house. That's terrific. And then if, if you, if you, would you leave that place, you know, that space like that there so that if they yeah. needed a place on the main floor for whatever reason, that they, that would still be there? Yes. So there's no reason to kind of undo a plan like that because, um, well, uh, I'll give you an example of a project that I did where I started out with this woman when her mother needed a wheelchair accessible bathroom. A few years later, she called me and said, um, my mother's passed away, but now I want to make my space so it's better for me. And as I interviewed her, I found out at one point she had actually had another woman come to live with her but the two of them were sharing one bathroom, and it, it just didn't end well. Um, no, I could see that could and, be a problem. <laughs> and although she didn't say, I want to do that again, I remembered that she was open to that sort of thing. So when we did the plan, I took um, three rooms that used to be kind of bedrooms that were really poorly placed, and I turned one into a dance studio sort of sitting ah. room <laughs> for her record collection. The next room was her sleeping area where she put the bed in the middle of the room to have space all the way around it because she's a very unconventional thinker. And then we created a closet and a, um, a, a bathroom for her, which is not fully accessible, but it's very space efficient and it's very luxurious. Oh, that's cool. And then there was one other room that was left over, which was where this other person had stayed. And by, by the placement of the doors, I decided not to get rid of the door between that room and Robin's, uh, uh, this woman's bathroom, um, so that she would have the ability at some time in the future to say, oh, I now need an accessible bathroom, so I'll use the one that's out in the hallway. Right. And I can have somebody stay with me to be a caregiver, and c she can have my bathroom. And so we have this room, this, oh, that's terrific, this setup it's that's very right. flexible. Flo I was going to say yeah. fluid. Yeah, that's great because yeah. I think people need that. And sometimes people feel like, oh, if I build this, I'm kind of stuck with this. You know, I'm pigeonholed into this. Yeah. So this is great to know that you have that kind of ability to make it s something fluid, something that can move with your needs and, and um, yeah. you know, the needs of your family so that you can stay where you are. So the key ingredient there was I did a really good interview. I listened very carefully. I asked a lot of questions that are really personal about how people live. And, and then I tried to incorporate those things. And in this case, it was simply recognizing that that door would make all the difference in terms of um, the flexibility right. of the floor plan. And so we left the door there. It's got a lock on it. And Robin, uh, the, I keep what, saying her name, wh she can control the lock right, right. as to however she wants right. it to be. And um, so I have a ton of stories like that where the little thing makes a big difference. So how would people, um, how would people be able to get in touch with you? Uh, because this is all very valuable information. So one of the ways that people get in touch with me is to visit my website. So it's Colin Healy Design. And if you Google that, you're going to find my my Facebook page, you'll find my website, and I have some downloads on the website. Uh, so I, I have this little plan here. Oh, there we go. So this is, this is a, um, a poster size plan that has 10 great ideas for making an accessible home that deal with some of these principles that we've been talking about, uh, including one called visitability which we touched on before, but, you know, grandma needs to come to your house right. when you're a young people, and when you're an older person, some of your friends are going to right. be challenged with accessibility. And I, I have to confess that in the last four years of my mother's life, she was never at our house because 
we live in an old house that is like six steps up right, to get into our house. And it wasn't accessible. And it wasn't was, accessible, right. and you wouldn't want your house to be that way right. if you could avoid it. So uh, I think that's great. Is there also any kind of like questionnaire that you have like that people can, you know, if they go on your website, they can ask themselves these questions to know if they're ready or to so get them to start to think about this? Well, actually, the answer to that is I don't yet, but there's one in planning. Oh, great. For that. So people and will so be that, glad to know that. That will be up soon. But I also offer a free um, half-hour consultation oh, that's terrific. On, on the phone. So if somebody wanted to get in touch with me, I'd be happy to talk with them and, and at least find out what their situation is about. And then I do have a, an accessibility uh, evaluation, which costs some money, but you get tremendous value out of it. And um, Sounds that so way. it's a step-by-step -step process. Right. And the other free download on my website is a, a free guide to how to plan a design project. So it, it gives you a, a taste of what are the kinds of questions that I'm going to be asking, what are the steps that you go through to do a home improvement. And it's equally valuable for a small as well as a large home improvement. Well. That's terrific. Well, this has been just terrific. I'm sure that our viewers got a ton of information, things that they probably haven't thought about. So I thank you so much for being here today, Colin. This was really terrific. My pleasure. It's been a lot of fun having this discussion. Okay, so great. Thanks for uh, tuning in today. Hope you enjoyed the show. This is Phyllis Amon saying goodbye until we see you next time on The Golden Years, Understanding Better Life. <laughs>